Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Weekend Watch Repair. My name is Adam. I appreciate you joining me here today. Next up on the bench is a super cool Seiko Rally Dial from 1968 that I picked up off of eBay for what I thought was a pretty good deal. This is going to be the next watch in the line of vintage budget rebuilds, and I think I bought this watch pretty good. Uh, I, th I think in total I spent 80 something dollars for like 80 or $85 for it. Um, and I, I think I way underpaid for this watch. It's just in fantastic shape. And that dial is what completely sold me. So what I'm doing here before we get started is just checking function of the watch. I'm checking the rollover of the day and date just to see if that is working. This particular movement's got a mechanism in it for, uh, to change the day and the date wheels at the same time. Pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting way they did it, but, uh, and we'll get into that, but everything seems to be working. Okay. There is a true quick set for the date. Uh, and you can see me doing that here just simply by pushing in the crown. The next thing we're going to do is put it on the time grapher and just see what kind of readings we get. Uh, at the time I hadn't looked up this movement, so I didn't know what the proper lift angle was. So it's just set at the default 52 degrees. Um, later on, I, I learned that this watch is a little bit higher. And the only thing that affects is the amplitude by a few degrees, but you can see this watch is running slow, really low amplitude. And the beat air is not bad. It would be nice to see those lines a little bit more parallel, but, um, you know, the thing's just in need of a service. It's pretty dirty, but overall the watch is just in stunningly good shape. So I am removing the straps that uh, were on it and just using a little bit of uh, plastic on my tool there to remove the snap on case back. And we're going to take a look at this thing. And uh, this is the first time I had opened up this watch as well, but um, they can't really make out much of anything on the case back. I think this watch had been serviced at some point uh, in its life previously, but it, it's definitely been a while, but they didn't mark the case back. So I'm, I'm checking function here of the automatic winding works. Uh, this is predating this particular watch does not have the uh, magic lever system that we've covered on a few different watches on this channel thus far. This one here is the Seiko's kind of interpretation of a, of a, of a more common Swiss style with reverser wheels. Although they, they do that with, in this one, it's, they call it a differential wheel and then they have some reduction wheels, but it's, Mechanically, it works the same, but it's completely different than what we've worked on in the past. So I'm excited to show everybody that. So what we're going to do here is uh, once we got that rotor off and we're going to just simply pull out the crown here real quick. Just taking a look at that. That gasket's hard and brittle and it's definitely due to be replaced. And the next step before we can pull the movement out of this watch, there are some case clamps. Uh, two case clamps on here that can be kind of a challenge to get out here. I, I show this one here. It's, it, it, it's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world sometimes to get these things out of there. They are, I mean, they're very small and they, they like to move around on you, but I finally got my tweezers in there to, uh, to get that thing out. And I'm going to go ahead and just pull that gasket off and that gasket. Um, this is what made me, one of the reasons it made me think that this watch had been worked on in the past. That gasket wasn't actually in too bad of a shape. It, um, if that was the original gasket on this watch, it would be, it would just break into pieces. Um, you know, at, by the age of this watch now, it, but when you pull it out, but, uh, here, I thought I'd be smart and use some Rodico and try to pull that case clamp out, but I ended up just kind of pushing it deeper in, but, uh, it moved out of the way so we can get the, the movement ring out of the way and, uh, just kind of taking a look at it. Uh, it's, it's not in bad shape. It's a little bit dirty, but, uh, you know, nothing terrible. Once that's out of the way though, uh, we can remove that second case clamp. And after that, we can get this watch out of the case. And this is what sold me. As soon as we, I pull this case off here, that dial is just unbelievable for its age. And I mean, it, it, the design, it, it's, it's as good as anything they make today, in my opinion. But I mean, and that watch, I mean, this watch is from 1968 and that dial is just perfect. I, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a really good value proposition for your money on some of these old Seikos. See, I'm trying to get the light to, to reflect off of that dial and you can just see that thing. I mean, it is just, that's just stunning how, how good that is. But in order to remove that dial, uh, there are two dial feet screws 
that we need to remove first. And so you see me loosening those here. And once that comes off, uh, I'm trying my best not to, you know, to see if I can remove it with my hands before I, you know, without getting, you know, something in there to wedge it open. And that thing came off pretty easily. There is a dial spacer on the back side of that dial right there, that little ring. And uh, I'll go ahead and pull that off. Sometimes those can be a bit stubborn, but um, actually what we'll do first here, and I was looking at that date code on the back as we've kind of reviewed on some of the previous videos, that 8N on the back of the dial, that represents 1968 for the 8 and N for November. And you see that same code on the case back. And actually what's kind of interesting on that is most of the time you'll see a month or two difference between the an original dial to an original case back uh, just due to their manufacturing process. Some, a lot of times there's one or two months difference. It's less common to find somewhere the case and the dial are from the same month, but, uh, and it doesn't really matter, but you can definitely tell it's or an original dial to the watch. So we're going to go ahead and start disassembling the movement and uh, we're going to remove that dial washer. And then there's no clip on this one. So we can just lift that day wheel right up and you can see that here on the back side, this is a, um, a s single language on the day wheel. So you've only got seven teeth on that gear. If it was a dual language day wheel, uh, you would see 14 teeth. Next up is the quick set lever. Or really it's, it's a setting lever for the day wheel. And that uh, is what indexes that day wheel into place and it's held on by one real specific shouldered screw. And next up, we can take off the cover plate. And this cover plate also has that spring for that uh, day wheel indicator. And uh, that spring is very touchy, very, it likes to fly. And uh, so we just kind of have to be real careful with that when we pull it off. But then um, these always make me nervous. That's why I'm picking it up with Rodico right here, just to make sure that that spring that you see right there doesn't, come off just trying to give myself a little bit of protection because if that thing goes flying there's a really good chance that I am not going to find it. The next thing to come off is the date wheel and what I should have really mentioned in some of my previous videos it's been in the descriptions but uh, uh, I wanted to make sure I, I put it in the in the video this is a if you didn't catch it earlier uh, when we took off the rotor this is a Seiko 5126A movement. Um, and that movement actually had a really short, all, the whole 5100 series of movements really weren't around for very long. Um, they came out in 1967 and uh, the last of the 5100 series was discontinued in, I believe, 1971. Um, there was a, a 5106, which is a 33 jewel. Um, they made from 67 to 70 and that was in their prismatic line. Uh, there's this movement, the 5126, which is a, the, of, of the Seiko five line of watches. There was two movements in those. There was a 23 jewel and a 27 jewel. The 5126, which is the one we're working on here was the 23 jewel. And, uh, the 5139 was the other one. And all those, uh, were just in production from 1967 to 70. And then in 1969, they came out with a 5146, which was a true high beat um, at 28,800 beats per hour. And uh, that was only in production for one year. Uh, that one uh, went out in late 70, I believe, maybe early 71. But um, interesting, the, this is a, um, a Dyni movement. And uh, if you're unfamiliar, Seiko basically had two separate watch companies, um, Dyni and Sua, and they were they pitted them together or against each other just as much as they pit, you know, were competing against other companies just in, for competition. Uh, these two separate companies competed very, you know, very much so with each other and would go to competitions with one another, um, submit, you know, their own, they would build their own movements, do their own design. And um, I mean, ultimately, I, you know, I think they, they were, you know, Seiko was trying to, you know, design and come up with the best product they could. And for a while there, there was an arms race between these two companies. Um, this one is a Dyni movement, but, um, you know, the Sua also had a lot of really interesting stuff. But if you've 
kind of never read up, read up on that. If you're interested in that kind of thing or really like these old Seikos, uh, like I do, uh, it's, it's definitely worth, definitely worth reading, but back to this video here. And uh, I kind of went long there, but really what you're watching here is a, an instructional, you know, on how not to take apart this, <laughs> this side of the watch. I, uh, I didn't study it very much and I started taking it apart and, you know, these parts I'm pulling out, I mean, you can see it's under spring tension and, um, I definitely learned my lesson taking this one apart here. I, um, you know, the, that, um, those two pieces that I pulled off in the cover plate prior are part of the quick set mechanism. And that's all held. There's a tension. Uh, there's tension on that long spring that I've, you saw just now noticed and I'm pulling off now. But, uh, and that should have come off first before any of that other stuff was disassembled. And normally, um, if you know what, what I should do is kind of study it a little bit and make sure I really understand how everything functions together. Like I said, I have never worked on this particular movement before. So, um, I should have taken more time to pay attention to how everything works together before I start, you know, disassembling it. But, uh, don't do it like you saw me do there. But I mean, it, that tells you exactly how not to do it later on in the video. When we put it back together, um, I, I, I it, that's a good, that's a good uh, instructional, you know, section on how, what the right way to do it is. But, um, here taking out that intermediate wheel and that kind of had uh, that radius cut on one side of the teeth there. And there's also a, on that particular one in this movement, there's also a kind of a, a raceway, a ledge that goes on the bottom side of that, where it, when it sits down on the main plate and raises that wheel up a little bit where it sits at the right height. But, um, I mean, that would fit in either way, but definitely if you put that one in the wrong way, it would, uh, it would not work out too well. And, uh, that's the yolk spring there. And that sucker was incredibly thick and it sits in a really deep recess in the main plate. And that thing was under, I was sure that thing was going to go flying, but, um, that's why you saw me use Rodico there and really just completely smother it because I did not want that thing to, to go off. And I really had to get my tweezers underneath it to pull it out. But um, the uh, hold down spring for the setting lever and then the, the sliding clutch right there. And then the last piece here we have, and take a look at that gunk on that. Wow. Yeah, that one, that thing there has, uh, was really dirty. But um, we pull the setting lever off, and I'll bring it back up here just so you can kind of see it real quick. But um, that is the last piece aside from the jewels on this side of the watch. So the first thing I did on the on the rear side of the watch, you know, I won't, I noticed that when I flipped the movement over and uh, put it back in the, uh, in the uh, movement holder, it stopped running. And so I didn't know if there was just hardly any power left in it. And that's the, that's the click you saw me there hit there with the screwdriver, but, uh, or, or but, uh, it didn't really move. So I'm I, generally, I like to remove power before I pull the balance up. You don't have to, but what you notice there is when I kind of turn the movement a little bit, just to, you know, position it where I could grab that screw with my tweezers, the, the balance kicked back in. And uh, I really think that's, you know, I, I, it's not supposed to, to do that obviously, but I think it's really a cause of just kind of the shape that this watch is in the movement wise. I mean, it's in good shape, but it is very dirty. Um, but, uh, you know, no harm done or anything, but we're going to go ahead and kind of take a quick look at this spring and just kind of eyeballing it just to see if anything's just blatantly incorrect. I mean, you really got to get it under higher magnification to see if really anything's wrong, but see, I'm checking that pallet fork and you can still see there's some energy still left in this watch. See how it's, you know, I'm not pushing it all the way in that there's energy pushing it in each direction, but, um, I'm going to, in order to remove power, we need to take apart the automatic winding works. And that wheel there is the wheel that connects the automatic winding works to the to the pinion that's on the underside of the, uh, the, the oscillating weight. But, um, this automatic works here has its own bridge. So we're going to go ahead and pull that off. And this one here has a really unique way of doing it. Um, between all these wheels here, uh, and you can see that one came off with it. That would be the, oh gosh, the second reverser idler wheel. Um, yeah. That, those are, those are the idlers. I'm 
you know, I know what the parts do, but the terminology sometimes gets me, but, um, that's the differential wheel. And, uh, you kind of, I'm thinking of that as in the, in the same context as, you know, it's kind of their version of what a more traditional Swiss style, you know, an ETA style movement with, um, the reversing wheels and all that, but, uh, that's kind of functioning in the same way, but, uh, we'll go ahead and take out that ref first reverser idler wheel. And then uh, there's two reduction wheels. Also, one of them is underneath this bridge here that I'm going to pull out. And there's one more reduction wheel that's actually, um, you could kind of see it there underneath the um, the bridge plate, that, and that's going to connect to the ratchet wheel. That's Again, everything on this movement's a little bit different. The ratchet wheel's a little bit underneath, is, is underneath the, the bridge plate on this. But you can see there when I hit that switch, you could you see that movement there. Uh, once with, with that out of the way, and now you can see that pallet fork has no energy left. So, uh, now we have successfully removed power from here. And so we're going to go ahead and pull the pallet fork bridge out and, uh, it's just two screws holding this on. And, uh, I'm, I'm making sure when I'm doing this to, you know, I, I don't know on this movement, I don't have any experience with it. So I don't know if those screws are the same as any others in the watch. So I'm cataloging them just kind of in a, my own, it's definitely, it's definitely overkill the way I do it. But, uh, you know, especially, you know, I do it like when I first started working on watches, how I, you know, every single screw went to the exact same spot, even if it could have gone into others. But, um, yeah, it's, I'm making sure I don't misplace those, but going to pull this, uh, that three slotted screw there. That's reverse thread. I'm going to pull that out, even though later on I learned, uh, you know, I technically didn't have to, um, that is, on a typical movement, when you see those that's on the crown wheel, and even though I'm going to go ahead and call it a crown wheel on this one, even because it functions in the exact same way, but it's a very tiny wheel on the other side of that bridge plate. But, um, that, uh, you, I could have just left that screw in and just pulled it. I mean, it'll, and it would all hold together and it, it all holds together still even without that screw. But like I said, I didn't know at the time I didn't have to pull that off, but, uh, it doesn't really matter. It all worked out well in the end, but we're going to go ahead and pull this bridge plate off and take a look here and you can see there's that um that uh second reverser wheel we have that smaller wheel is the crown wheel if you want to call it that and then the click and the click spring is underneath there and so here i'm going to pull out the fourth wheel and that's kind of a doubled fourth wheel uh because it's uh can also connect with the center seconds pinion right here but um yeah that one's actually in pretty good shape we're gonna go ahead and pull out the third wheel and just check the pivots on this and then pull out the escape wheel. And this escape wheel's got a really long pivot on it. Um, so uh, uh, super easy to bend those, but um, it looked okay. Now we're gonna pull the the the, the barrel assembly out here and the, uh, the ratchet wheel's kind of uh, just attached to it. I mean, it, it removes, but it's just kind of stuck on there. But and then uh, the center wheel has its own little kind of multi-level bridge there and I'm, I'm looking at those two screws from that bridge just to see if they are the same because if you take a look at this bridge here you know it's kind of got two it's kind of a split level so I just want to make sure if they were different I noted that but I'm gonna go ahead and pull this off here and uh yep bad tweezer technique and all I don't know what can I say <laughs> I am not a professional but um we're going to get that out of the way and then pull, I need to dress those tweezers, but yeah, pull the center wheel out and, uh, we're good to go on this thing. Uh, just down to some free cleaning. Oh, you know, we're not, it's the very last part, you know, that's the one you always forget, but I didn't forget it when I was doing it, but I'm forgetting it when I'm narrating. And, um, that's the, the, uh, the pin or the post for the setting lever. And that's the one part you always forget. And I mean, you'll get that whole thing put together. And then realize, oh, you got to take it all back apart just to put that thing on. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull this uh, second reduction wheel off here. It's got its own little bridge holding that down. And uh, pull that out of the way. I'm going to inspect the this wheel here just to make sure that everything kind of is looking good on it. A little dirty. Good light glare, so it's you don't really see it on camera too much. That is the crown wheel. <laughs> it's attempt at a crown wheel, but it does function. It does what a crown wheel should. 
And then the, the last thing we have here is one screw for the, uh, for the click. And uh, that comes off and you can see I pinged it all off there and that little horseshoe shaped spring that I actually lost on this watch. Um, I don't know how I lost it because I, it actually went into the cleaning machine. And when I got it out and I was sorting parts, I never found it. I had to make my own. And unfortunately I kind of got so wrapped up in what I was doing. I forgot to hit record, but I ended up fabricating my own spring on this because I didn't want to wait, you know, three and a half weeks in international shipping for a couple dollar part when I could make my own. These bridges here kind of separate from the middle and uh, that spring there. And man, look at all that rubbing on that, on that barrel wall. I mean, this spring here is, um, it's, it's seen better days. Um, I mean, it doesn't look, you know, it's not completely covered in grease, which is actually a good thing, but you see all that wear on the inside of that, where the, you know, the, the, the coating, the plating on that barrel is worn away and it's down to the brass on that thing. And, um, I mean, that's just that spring being out of flat and, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna, when you get that spring under tension, it's going to kind of, when it coils up around that Arbor, it's never going to sit perfectly flat, but it's, it's definitely got a lot of use. So we're going to go ahead and replace that mainspring, but, uh, we're going to go ahead and disassemble the case here. And so we, uh, snap on, the bezel was a snap on bezel. And then now uh, once we get that off, that just crystal pops out and the crystal's in great shape and it's got a flat gasket, which I'm not sold was originally on this watch. Cause I was looking at the casing guide, the old Seiko document for this, that shows the casing guide. And it does not reference that, that, uh, that O ring. It references these two that I'm going to pull out here. Um, this one here, it's kind of got some marks on, you can tell it's dirty but it's actually in really good shape. And, um, this one here, I mean, it, it's a very unique part. I can't, you know, I can't f buy this one as a generic. I, 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 at least I don't think I could, but, um, I would have to source an OEM part, but I mean, I cleaned it up the best I could. A couple of the marks were still on there, you know, the color, but I mean, it was still flexible. Uh, you know, it was, it wasn't eaten up at all. It was in excellent shape. And then, that, um, that, uh, that gasket right there. And so, uh, yeah, the casing guide referenced those, but not that black deal. I, I don't know. I mean, it could have been original to the watch. I don't know. It definitely worked because you saw how clean that dial was. I mean, it's not like stuff was getting in there, but, um, anyways, once those are all off, there's the, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's six pieces just to assemble the front side of that case. That's uh there's a lot to it, but, um, here uh, we're getting beginning assembly and I've already lubricated the side walls with braking grease and um, have a new spring. And before you freak out on me, you know, everyone always says, you know, the color side on those replacement mainsprings, the color side of the washer always faces upwards. That's true. If you know, it's wound in the right way, you know, this spring is the exact correct dimensions, but you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, Japanese style movements, you know, and Swiss movements, a lot of times the, the springs don't wind in the same direction. So it's not always a guarantee. You have to pay attention to what way the springs oriented in that washer. And in this particular, particular one, this is the first time I can remember seeing it that way. But, um, you know, don't just, ne um, you can't just arbitrarily go by the color guide on that washer because one side's kind of got paint. It'll be red or blue or something. And then the other side, just base metal. But um, just make sure it's oriented the right way. So I flipped it around the other way and springs in the right direction and everything was happy. But uh, we got the barrel in, got it re-lubricated, and we're going to go ahead and put it on here on our barrel closer just to apply even pressure. And uh, maybe on the next video, if I can remember, I'll um, I'll leave the audio in for that part because that gives you, you know, a, most of the time a, a click. But um, I went ahead and bypassed videoing all the jewel cleaning, uh, that was done. This is the test afterwards where I, you know, I get everything lubricated on the balance assembly and then back in on the cleaned main plate. And then I'm just kind of using my phone here just as a test. And I always like them to go at least 30, 40 seconds or so. And right here, when we get up here, you know, that wheel's starting to, to wind down, but that worked out good. And I'm just doing some close inspection here, making sure that the impulse jewel is sitting 
is dead center at rest between those banking pins. Um, and it's in line with the pallet fork and the escape wheel and checking the flatness of the hairspring there and uh, checking its engagements into the regulating pins and just kind of making sure that everything looks good. And this one here is looking really, really good. Um, no major issues. So we're just going to move forward. Beginning assembly, I'm going to go ahead and get that first part in, that, <laughs> that last one that uh, that we took out, that um, that pin or the post for the setting lever. So I'm going to lubricate that and uh, get that put in place. You can see my little like and subscribe animation there. Uh, that would mean a lot, actually, if you'd like and subscribe the video. I know it's a real small channel, and, uh, you know, I'm, I don't do this full time. I'm not making a living at it. I'm not, I mean, I'm not even monetized. I'm not trying to make any money at it. I just enjoy doing it. But, uh, you know, hey, if the channel grows, that would be all right with me. So um, if you do enjoy these videos, I put a lot of work in them, and I would appreciate you if you did like or leave a comment. Apparently, you know, YouTube likes that kind of stuff. So by all means. So we're going to get this center wheel put in place. And uh, I went ahead and lubricated uh, both sides of that center wheel with uh, HP 1300. And um, I find it a, a, a little bit cleaner to, to lubricate it that way. I mean, you can lubricate the jewel, absolutely. But, uh, and then let cap capillary action really pull that in. But uh, to me, I just find it easy to do it that way. So that's just kind of how I've done it. But uh, once I get that on, I'm just double checking in shake on all these clean parts just to make sure that everything's looking good. And I think, yeah, we'll get a close up here. You can see the in shake, the up and down. In shake is kind of the vertical up and down movement. Uh, side shake is think of it as horizontal left and right. And so if you have like a, your pivots are worn out or something and you have a lot of play where that pivot goes into the jewel or into the, into the, you know, into the bearing and there's a lot of side movement back and forth and it's wobbly, that's side shake in shake looked really great on that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, uh, I lubricated, uh, the post, the bottom post for that, uh, for that barrel assembly and we're going to go ahead and get that put in place and uh i'm going to put lubrication on here if i remember right yeah when i edited the video uh, so i lubricated that point there and that's where the the uh the ratchet wheel is going to go and then uh what i forgot to do in the edit was um i lubricated the actual pivot above that the sticks above that there is some lubrication on there as well uh hp 1300 where it's actually going to go onto the bridge plate so now we can get the train of wheels started and uh, we're going to start with this one with uh, basically the lowest wheel first and uh, the escape wheel. And uh, I, I kind of left this uncut if, um, and uh, you, there's going to kind of be a long stretch of video here with me setting in these wheels because they don't always go in easily. And then this one, this watch, it certainly did not, you know, you, you have to fiddle with it and, it, it took me a bit to kind of get everything straight. And even though I know that you know, I'm trying to get everything perfectly vertical, each wheel, and then assuming as soon as I touch it and put the next wheel on, the old ones are going to fall out of place. But anyone that's kind of worked on these watches, I'm sure you're probably doing the same thing I am. Um, uh, but we got the escape wheel in, the third wheel, and now we're putting in the fourth wheel. And, uh, you know, this one here, it's kind of got the, it's it's got that uh, pinion on the bottom side of that, that deal is kind of, it has to go in there and mesh in with the second wheel. And then, uh, the top gear has got to touch the third wheel. And then we still have to put in the center seconds pinion. And, uh, there's a lot of stuff that kind of has to sit all together. Some shaky hands. I remember this was uh, later in the evening when I was doing this, I was hungry too. I hadn't eaten yet, but, uh, we're going to put in the center seconds pinion and get that in there. And um, once it gets close to that fourth wheel, I'm not going to press down hard or anything on it because you have to make sure the teeth engage and I don't want to hurt anything. So I kind of move that fourth wheel out of the way a little bit and then uh, put it kind of back in place and make sure that fourth wheel is engaging both the third wheel and that center seconds pivot and uh, the, pin the pinion on the bottom side of that thing engaging with the second wheel. There's a, there's a lot going on with that little wheel train. But... Um, we need to install the bridge to cover those. In order to do that, we have to assemble the bridge. So we're going to start here with that uh, second reduction wheel for the automatic works and uh, get its pivot put in place. And I, I think at this point, yeah, I kind of changed my editing technique just because, I mean, it. I, I my videos are long. 
right? I mean, it's, I don't really think it's a secret now and I'd love them to be like 45 minutes or so, but I also wanted to be as thorough as I can. So I was like, well, I mean, I guess they don't technically need to see me, you know, doing the, you know, the tweezers every time, you know, pulling, every, putting every screw in with tweezers, you know, I can just show you me screwing it in. Long cut here. I finally remembered once I got the new pivot, the new spring in place, I had assembled the, um, the, uh, click spring assembly. And that spring was probably about 45 minutes to make it. Um, what I did was I used a, um, a spring from another movement that had the right diameter spring steel. And then, uh, basically it's bent like a letter C and then on one tip, tip of the C it points upwards and the other one points downwards. And, uh, you just kind of had to bend it into the right shape. And I, I worked it around, but that thing works like a charm. Now I'm actually really proud of how that came out. It is not, no, it's not an original part. I don't think anyone's going to, you know, break me over the coals for that one. But, uh, I mean, it would have been about $25 and maybe three weeks to a month before, you know, waiting on that part. And I could just make it, you know? So of course, yeah. I mean, if a more serious part had broken, I absolutely would have ordered it, but I just wanted to try my hand at it. You know, it's not like I'm not a professional, right? So I don't really get an opportunity to make parts at least simple enough parts that I have the capability of making, but uh, that one worked out well. So we're putting on the bridge here. And uh, the one thing we have to make sure of is that the, uh, the crown wheel on the underside of that bridge is engaging with the ratchet wheel on the barrel and then everything's kind of working in place. So I kind of got that in there. You saw me move that around at first and then I kind of did a little tap trick and now I'm putting just the slightest amount of pressure on the bridge, making sure those pivots are seated all the way and kind of once everything found its spot and you if you notice while I was tapping it, it, um, it, it, you really saw a, a shift and then it really, that whole plate just kind of sat down and, uh, it worked like a charm, but, um, here, and since we already have the winding works in there, you can see this thing's got a really good amount of kickback, really good. And that really surprised me. But, um, once I make sure everything's in place to do a final torque down on that, and then I'm just going to Give it one more test here just to make sure that everything is working good. That kickback made me really happy. You know, another thing I'd noticed, uh, if you're, if you're kind of looking at this thing and it, it looks like if on the left side of that, like at the nine and 10 o'clock positions on the main plate and on the barrel bridge, it almost looks like fingerprints. I, um, I agree. And I actually, I took some Rodico to that and everything else. And I mean, those are not mine. Those are if they are fingerprints, they're, you know, oils from someone for, from however long ago. And those marks are permanent. So, um, I did look at that and I tried to clean that up, but it did not want to clean off. So I did, and it's purely cosmetic and doesn't really hurt anything, but, um, you know, it kind of tells you the history of the watch. So we need to assemble the automatic works and we, uh, in order to lubricate this differential wheel, um, basically the same way as a reversal wheel, we use a, a lubrication called Lubetta V105. Um, it's a lubrication they say is, I mean, for reverser wheels. And really what it is, is a mixture of alcohol and a thin lubricant, like a 90-10 lubricant. And the idea is, I mean, you dip it in there for about 10, 15 seconds, and then uh, you kind of blow off the excess, and then you let it dry. And uh, the instructions for the lubrication say don't put it on any reactive materials like plastics or anything that may react to the alcohol or anything in there. But um, so I just use a sticky note, to cover it with um, that little cover and leave it for about 15 minutes. But really what, you, what it does is once the alcohol dries, it leaves a very, very, very thin coat of that thin lubrication on there. And um, uh, the you can, yeah, it, it works out pretty well. And I think uh, there's another channel there that, I mean, he's a professional watchmaker. That's where I learned about that is uh, his channel. I don't know if it'd be proper for me to, you know, say the channel on my video, but um, he does a lot of videos about, you know, new people learning the hobby and uh, gives you kind of tips and tricks. And uh, he, he, I mean, just a, does a great job. I love his channel. He's not even, hadn't been doing it very long. He's been doing it longer than me, but I think he's still under a year, but, um, that's where I learned it. He's the one who I, I watched his videos and I was like, Oh, well that makes sense because, you know, I use a mixture of a uh, lubrication and alcohol as a, a, a case lubricant for a completely unrelated hobby. Uh, but it basically the alcohol dries and your lubricant remains on the part. 
And uh, so it's the same thing. But here we got the, those reverse idler wheels put in place. That second one was a little bit stubborn, as you saw, and we're going to put on the bridge. And uh, so there's three pivots in that uh, that arbor that's on that second idler wheel that we need to align. And the differential differential wheel pivot does not want to go into place here. It uh, And it, one of the easiest ones it should be is not wanting to go into place. So here I'm going to just barely nudge that differential wheel. And there we go. That pivot dropped right down. And then you can see it all kind of all fell into place like it should. So, and one thing I should point out is that um, I didn't, I don't know if it was necessary. I, I just don't. But uh, what I did was on the pivots, on the pivots for the, the differential wheel, I went ahead and um, cleaned just the pivots to remove that Lubetto V105 because I wanted to, you know, I'm going to lubricate upper and lower sides of that when I lubricate everything else. And uh, I just didn't want it to mix in, you know, mix different lubrication. So, I mean, it, I'd, it probably wouldn't have mattered really. I mean, it's, but I, you know, again, watchmaking is a great hobby if you are obsessive compulsive like me. So, um, I went ahead and, uh, just use a little pith wood and, uh, clean the, just the pivots off of just that differential wheel. And, uh, just that way that when I applied my lubrication here, like you see me doing for the train wheel and for the automatic works, um, you know, everything was exactly like I wanted it to be. So, um, the escape wheel and the fourth wheel, I uh, got 9010. That third wheel got HP 1300. And um, using a combination of HP 1300 and 9010 on the uh, automatic it works as well. So we're going to lubricate the underside of the movement real quick here. And that's the escape wheel. You can tell by the teeth. That is the third wheel with HP 1300. And there we go. That is the fourth wheel, uh, 9010 as well. We had already lubricated the center, the center wheel, so that one's good. And this is just the automatic works. Uh, those two jewels and those two bearings, we're going to get those lubricated. And the last thing is the uh, lubrication for the um, second reverser wheel. Um, I didn't show it on the main plate, on the, on the bridge plate, but uh, that one part that's underneath the bridge uh, that connects to the ratchet wheel, uh, that got some HP 1300. So here we're installing the um, the wheel that connects to the first idler wheel, uh, reverser idler wheel, and uh, that that that's what connects th from the the pinion or the gear on the underside of the oscillating weight to the automatic works, and uh, that's where that energy transfers through that wheel. So we'll get that tightened down, and uh, next we can install the pallet fork. And uh, again, I you know I, I I didn't cut out you know I could just. I could edit the video down or I could just drop it in place and then you see a bridge going on. But sometimes you, you know, you have to mess with these a little bit just to make double sure that that pivots in the right spot and everything's square before you, before you drop on the pallet fork. And that's what you see me doing here is uh, just kind of getting that pallet fork in place, making sure that the stones are in between the escape wheel teeth and that uh, everything's kind of as close as I can get it before I put that, before I put the bridge on here and uh, here, I'm just kind of setting that bridge in place and then just using just very, very light pressure just to make sure that everything is good to go. So um, here, and I actually kept, <laughs> I said before I, you know, I cut out just me using my tweezers to put in the screws, but here you can see me putting in those two screws and then just doing a final tighten down on it. Once I had everything, you know, in line and good to go. So the next step is just to put a little bit of wind in the watch so we can, um, easiest way to do it is just to, uh, rotate that, uh, that reverse threaded screw on the, uh, crown wheel. And now you can see the energy in that pallet fork moving it back and forth and you can get, you know, you gotta get it halfway and then it kind of jumps to the other side of the banking pins. And this is Mobius 9415. We're putting on the very tip of the exit stone. This is a, um, a, what is it, 19,200 feet per second movement or 19,000, whatever it is. Uh, but there's 15 escape wheel teeth, so a small dab of lubricant of that grease on the tip of that exit stone and uh, rotate it around five times and lubricate that escape wheel. And next, we're going to put on the balance. And uh, I put that on, and uh, that bottom pivot just dropped right into place, which is, I'm pretty lucky in that regard. So um, once that pivot kind of finds its home, then I rotate it around and then uh, we kind of get it set into place here, like you see. 
Then I'm just gently pressing it down just to kind of, you know, seed it as far down as I can very gently before I start, you know, putting in the screw, but that thing fired up and it's looking pretty good. Um, I get the screw on, not fully tight yet, but I just want to take a look here and uh, we'll get the microscope shot in. And I'm uh, looking at that roller table and, and um, uh, jewel there. And uh, it's, I mean, that thing's rotating around really great. If you got a super low amplitude, like 150, because you got something really messed up or something, I mean, you'll, you'll see that that thing's not rotating around all the way. But um, I mean, that hairspring looked great. And uh, I mean, I cut that out, but I'm, I, I got in there and I was looking at the reg, you know, the regulator arms and all that. So here uh, again, this is just a, um, this is late at night, but uh, I just, I dialed it in a little bit. This is just initial readings. Really? These really don't mean much. I mean, this watch needs to run in for a day, you know, 24 to 36 hours to really search you know, get that lubrication worked around where it should. And, uh, that, those lines will clean up some, that amplitude will come up a little bit more, but, um, this tells you, I mean, you could put it on there immediately. And if you got something really wrong, you'll know it. And so, um, you know, I, I always put it on a time grapher right after, you know, 20 minutes or so after it's, you know, we got the balance in just to kind of get an initial deal, just a quick regulation, just in one position, not final by any means. But um, that'll, it'll tell you if you're on the right track or not. And if you have something horribly wrong, you'll know. So you don't waste another, you know, hours doing anything else. You can troubleshoot, but that looked good. So um, we're going to go ahead and get this dial side assembled. And so we've got the setting lever in place. Uh, we got that, and then uh, we got the hold down spring for the setting lever on there. And that's what kind of keeps it kind of engaged with the stem. So we put the sliding clutch in. We uh, lubricated a post there and I'm putting some grease here on that sliding clutch. And then we, uh, we lubricated the post for the yoke and then we're going to drop in the yoke, get that on that post there, just like that and get it in that recess on the sliding clutch. That's looking good. And now we have that giant spring coming up next. But first thing what I'm doing here is I'm moving these parts around to see where the setting lever is going to engage with the yoke. It, um, I, to me, I just, I find it easier just to, if I'm not super familiar with the movement, uh, just to kind of see where all the mating surfaces are going to be so I can lubricate them. Um, it's not, you know, it, I, I didn't get every spot, you know, initially, and I'll go back in later once I get everything assembled and touch up what I need to touch up, lubricate, make sure I lubricate what needs to be lubricated because all the pieces are there and, you can see all the interactions, but, um, it, it's just, I, I find it easy to do it that way. Next up we have, you know, the ping omatic spring that just wants to go flying because it's ridiculously oversized and, um, it's putting a lot of power on that yoke. So I'm going to use my hold down tool and, um, kind of hold this down in its recess in the main plate, which is super deep. And, uh, remember if you saw me when I had to pull that out, I had to basically pry that thing out of there. But um, we're going to get that bottom side pressed in first. And now you can see with that spring unbent, you know, how much travel there is in that thing to get it in there. And boop, it went right underneath the setting lever and actually bumped that setting lever out of place where it's not sitting in the, the recess in the, uh, the sliding clutch anymore. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, these things happen sometimes, but um, I'm going to go ahead and get that spring set into place just like that. Now it's engaged with the yoke properly into it. There's a recess cut out in the, in the yoke specifically for that spring. And I'm going to pull that yoke down with my brass tweezers here and kind of get it back into that sliding clutch. And then very, very carefully, I'm, I'm nervous right now because I don't want to pull my tool off that spring, but you have to. But um, I realized also that I, you know, I hadn't lubricated that spring where it engaged with the, the yoke. I should have just lubricated that yoke before I installed it, but I didn't. So I'm pulling that spring down further with my old down tool and then setting it back into place, praying that it doesn't go flying, but everything's there. And now you can see that spring fully set into place. And that sucker is putting some pressure on that yoke, but um, everything's where it should. And now I'm going to just take a bit of Rotico and clean up the excess grease on the tops of those parts. And this is by, I mean, in no means the only time I'm going to do this, 
uh, even, even on the other side of the movement also, I know it wasn't shown in the video, but you know, as I would go and, you know, progress, I would use Rodico and just clean up a few things here and there as needed. But um, putting some HP 1300 here on that intermediate wheel and uh, the, the radius cut for that wheel goes down. And then again, there's that raceway on the bottom side of that wheel that, that goes downwards as well. And it kind of makes that wheel sit proud a little bit. Now I'm just putting some grease here uh, for the setting lever spring on the, um, on the setting lever. And we're going to go ahead and uh, get the setting lever spring put in place here. And that also acts as a cover plate for the, uh, for the yoke uh, engaged into the, the sliding clutch and kind of holds that down. So we'll get the screw in, but not tighten down fully, just loose. That way we can um, bend the spring here very gently, of course, and uh, get it on that setting lever, just like you saw. And then we can tighten down the spring all the way or the screw all the way on that spring. And we're good to go there. Now <laughs> you, get, you get to see the right way to, to reassemble um, you know, the quick set mechanism for this, um, for this keyless works. Yeah, definitely. You know, if, if you're using this video as some sort of a guide for the 5126 a movement, just completely ignore, you know, everything I had on the, uh, the first part of the video where I took it apart wrong, but, um, reference here and just do everything in reverse. Um, it's only a couple parts. It's not even complicated, but I just didn't pay it. I didn't study it well enough when I took it apart, like I mentioned earlier, but um, those two pieces uh, underneath this cover plate, that is um, what engages uh, with uh, a couple different parts, the setting lever. When you push in the setting lever, it engages those parts and between those two parts, it rotates up and just clicks over that, uh, that date wheel one day. And it, I mean, it works like a charm. Um, very tactile feel when you're on your crown. I mean, you feel a, a click, you absolutely know that it's advanced. I mean, and it feels really good. I mean, it's an excellent system, but uh, I mean, they, they created different ones down the road that do the same thing with fewer parts. And I can't say I blame them, but, uh, once that cover plate got put in, I'm uh, putting a little bit of, uh, grease here, uh, where that, uh, that spring is going to go and, uh, sit against that post. But uh, we'll get that spring put in place here. And there's a post there where it sits over and then uh, one screw. And just, just like the uh, setting lever spring, that screw is going to go in, but not all the way, but just in so the part can't come off. And then we'll go ahead and set that spring where it needs to go. And then uh, on that post, we just lubricate it. And then we can just finish tightening down that screw. And um, that thing is good to go. It's exactly what you want. So the next thing that we have to assemble is the crown and to get that in and I'm lubricating it and I lubricate that part wrong. <laughs> As you just see, I wasn't paying attention, but, um, that's, that's where the, gra that's where the crown gasket goes later on when I, you know, at towards the end of the video, when uh, it's time to, you know, I'm finishing assembly on everything and, uh, I'm like, ah, oh, time for a new gasket and I go over there and I'm like, oh, I still got grease on that thing. So, uh, I cleaned it off and uh, properly put a gasket on it with silicone grease like I should, but yeah, you don't have to grease that part. That was funny. I, I just decided to keep it in the video again. I mean, this is weekend watch repair. I have a day job that is not watch repair. This is a hobby of mine that I've enjoyed for a long time and I'm, I'm getting better at, but, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be dishonest. And I mean, I make mistakes, so, you know, I'll put them in there. doesn't bother me, but, um, we get the crown in or, and the stem in, and now I'm checking function on everything and seeing what needs to be lubricated. And I see that there's some parts here, like on the quick set where those two parts interact. Uh, there needs to be some lubrication there and um, a few other spots here. I kind of get all that done. There's um, that very, very tip post on the setting lever where it engages with the quick set. I didn't show me putting lubrication on it, but you can see a little bit there on the tip of that part where I put it on. And then, um, just cause that's metal on metal, but, um, now I'm going to just take Rodico and clean up the excess here. And what you want is just a, a film on the mating surfaces. You don't need globs of grease around. And uh, I mean, that, that grease doesn't really travel that much. It's not like it'd be the end of the world, but it definitely did need to be there. But now we've got grease where we need it. We're putting that, some of that same grease on, um, on the, uh, 
center wheel and uh, we can install our cannon pinion. One thing that always makes me nervous, I'm always afraid that I'm gonna bend that pivot for the uh, the seconds uh, hand. Uh, and on this one, it's that center seconds pinion. So like right when I get the cannon pinion over it, I drop it off my tweezers and just kind of let it fall on there where, you know, if it does touch, it's not gonna hurt anything. And then I'll take my tweezers and press it down. But uh, once we get that cannon pinion in place, uh, you saw me lubricate the main plate there for that minute wheel. And uh, just making sure that minute wheel is engaging with that intermediate wheel and the cannon pinion, that those gears are engaging on both sides. Then we can install the cover plate. And uh, this cover plate is, uh, if I can get it turned around here. This cover plate just takes one screw. Um, a lot of them on the previous Seiko movements have two, but that other hole there is actually not a screw hole. That is a like a viewing window, so you can see the interaction between the minute wheel and the 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 minute wheel and the intermediate wheel. So that's pretty cool. So next up, we need to install the calendar works. Uh, so I'm putting a little bit of lubrication there on the post and just a dab on that little raceway here, and uh, we'll put the calendar driving wheel in. And that calendar driving wheel has got that little spring assembly, and then the um, the the driver for the uh, the date wheel. And uh, the reason like you can rotate that, you know, your hands backwards to do the semi quick set on the day is um, that's going to be under tension, right? And the, the way that wheel shaped, it doesn't, the reason they tell you not to rotate your watch backwards because you can damage it is, you know, it, you know, if you don't have that, that thing is purposely designed to go backwards and not damage anything. That spring will push that driving arm inwards. And then you, it'll, once it gets past that tooth on the date wheel, You'll see that day wheel uh, just kind of shake or move slightly, and you know it's just gotten past the point of that spring, and then you can rotate it forward. But, I mean, that's purposely designed to do that. So now we put on the hour wheel, and the hour wheel, I'm going to pull this hour wheel back off here in a minute. I'm kind of testing it just to make sure everything's good, and I put a, a Dynadab HP 1300 on the can on the outside of the can pinion for that hour wheel. Um, but... There's the gear that runs the, the date driving wheel. Most of the time you'll see an intermediate gear between those, between the hour wheel and the date driving wheel. But on this one, it's a pinion, a real large pinion on the underside. Yeah, here we go. I do pull it off here and show you. But uh, that gear on the underside, and that's what's driving that uh, that calendar wheel. So um, that's where that's coming from. That's why there's no visible intermediate wheel like most of the watches that I've had on this channel. So the next thing up is the... Uh, setting lever or indexing lever for the uh, the date wheel. So uh, we'll get that setting lever put into place. And all that does is that doesn't advance it. All that does is determine the stopping point of where that day wheel or date wheel stops, um, you know, dead center between each tooth. But uh, we'll get that put into place. And um, I'm applying a little bit of grease on the back side of that where the spring is going to go and then just cleaning off little bit of the excess here and um, a tiny bit of um, Mobius 9010 on here. It doesn't take much. And uh, just, just so, you know, it, it, it everything kind of runs smoothly, but this spring here, um, it fought me a little bit. Um, I actually went and ended up taking a break and for a while, then coming back to it. Like, but the first time I, I set this in, it actually goes in really easily. And you'll see here, like this is the first time I did it. And uh, it it went in without much trouble. And so I thought everything was great, but I wasn't really paying attention. And I think a lot of you, if you're watching this channel and you know you saw how this watch comes apart, you already saw my mistake that I'm making right here. And you, you already know what's coming. But um, like that spring is in and I'm using my flat side of my tweezers to hold it down. I'm thinking, oh, great. You know, this thing's, that was easy. Cool. On to the next thing. So we're going to put on the date wheel. And we put on the date wheel, but you got to index that, that lever that we just installed in between two teeth on that wheel. And, uh, you know, that means moving it out of the way. And so I thought I'd be smart here and hold down the spring and just, you know, move that arm out of the way and set it between two teeth and boom, spring goes out of place. So, you know, I kept this all one shot here. So, you know, at first I, a couple of attempts, a couple of attempts and I'm holding down that spring and I'm like, ah, it's not really, doing it. So I step away for a minute and then I come back, move it again. And now make sure that indexing lever, the setting lever is in between the teeth. And then now I can move that spring into place. And really what I should have done is put that date wheel on first or put the, the indexing lever on first and put the date wheel on. Then just put that spring in last 
and it probably would have been easier, but um, that was my mistake. But uh, I mean, it's, it's not a terrible one to make definitely fixable as long as you don't lose that spring. But unfortunately you just got to play with that spring a little bit more than you really want to. Cause once they're in place, I really don't want to redo it, but everything's fine. So, uh, I put that, uh, day wheel spring on this uh, cover plate and then I'm just very gently going to put this down here just to try to avoid popping that spring out of place. Cause that's the one I fear the most. The very first time I worked on a Seiko movement that had one of those, um, I lost that. I mean, to this day, I've never found it. So it's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those, it comes off pretty easily, but, um, I'm going to get these three screws in, not tightened down fully, just kind of, I mean, all the way down, but not torqued. And by torqued, I mean, I don't mean a lot. I mean, it doesn't, I'm not putting a lot of torque on anything in this watch, but I mean the right amount of torque for, for a watch. But, um, once that's done and I see everything's flat, you know, I'm just final tightening on that. And, um, we can move on. And now we need to put the uh, setting lever or indexing lever or whatever you want to call it for the day wheel in place. So um, I did lubricate that post up top. Uh, wasn't in the video, but um, that got a, just a tiny dab of lubrication. And then uh, I'm going to lubricate here where that arm engages with the spring and then lubricate here. This has got a shouldered screw because that arm rotates underneath it. Now you see that little glob or whatever it was. I used a bit of Rodico to clean that up. As soon as I got under the microscope, I saw that and I'm like, well, that's got to come out. But I, I get the screw started that, th uh, that shoulder screw started. Then I move that arm a little bit. That way I can screw it down and, uh, into that recess and get it tightened down. Just like that. Now I'll just give it a test. And if you put the wrong screw in there, something you'll know it because it won't move freely. But I mean, you can see that's why that screw is special. And it's got that special shoulder on it because you can get it tightened down all the way and it still rotates. So now I'm just checking the function of the calendar works. Um, advancing the date wheel and checking the quick set, making sure the quick set works and that works just fine. Um, I ended up doing this quite a bit just to distribute that lubrication around a little bit. But um, that's looking good. So now we can put on the the day wheel. So that, and I'm just using my smallest screwdriver here. You can also use an oiler, but um, moving that indexing arm out of the way and then letting it come back and it'll, it'll find its home between two teeth on that wheel. And next we can put on the dial washer. So we're getting close. And now my favorite part of this watch, this gorgeous, gorgeous original dial. I mean... Not a mark on it. I I mean, man, that thing's good looking. But uh, what I did is that uh, dial spacer that uh, was underneath it. I went ahead and attached that to the dial before I put it on the watch. Uh, it just makes it easier. Uh, but once that's done, we'll get those two uh, dial feet screws done. And now I'm just going to uh, do a quick function test again because I didn't want to rotate that around without the dial on because that day wheel could come up and move out of place. But uh, I'm just... Uh, checking everything to make sure it works. Everything's moving like it should. I'm going backwards. You can see how that Thursday kind of jumped a little bit. And now Friday, now I want to go backwards. See how it goes Friday, comes back to Friday. That tells you that spring's gone past its point and you can move it again. So everything's working good. So now it's time to set the hands. So I'm rotating this around to right where the date wheel stops. So that should be midnight or thereabouts. And uh, we can install the hands. I'm still trying to come up with a good way to really show these. I mean, this video is better than the other ones, but it's, you know, I still want to do better, but, um, getting that hand, our hand set in place first. And, um, I'm going to kind of, it's a little off center. So I'm just a little bit, not just tiniest amount of pressure just to, so when I move this over to the, um, the tool here, you might notice that's a different tool than you've seen before. I did spend a little bit of money and, uh, I've wanted one of these for a while found a deal on one and, uh, ended up purchasing it. And I love having the clear hands to, you know, the, the clear pushers to where you can really see what you're doing. And here I'm setting down the, um, the, uh, the minute hand and, uh, the, uh, tip on that, that, uh, goes on the, uh, on that is, it's not very deep. So, I mean, it sits flush. It barely sits down at all. There, there's a sizable gap between those two hands, but I was looking at it and that's by design. But um, we'll get that set on. But yeah, that, that tool is expensive for what it is. I mean, I get it super well-made, super well-made. 
And uh, so I, I definitely get why it costs a lot of money, but I mean, everything they have is overpriced. But uh, that tool there is just a blunt tip that's not hollow. So um, just pressing on that second hand and then double checking again to make sure everything's straight. And you can see that gap between the hour hand and the minute hand, but that's the way these are. Just kind of the way everything's sitting at the bottom of where it should be seated. But um, this thing's running good. Uh, uh, you just double check everything. I, I made sure that the, you know, the hands are aligned at the hour indices and that everything's looking good. And so, yeah, this watch here is really coming together. So the next thing we need to do is put this case back together. And um, I went ahead and put that uh, gasket back in that little chapter ring. And then, um, you know, just making sure that's seated in. We're getting both those gaskets. And you can see, I mean, I cleaned up that blue one. I mean, it's still got a few marks on it. That thing's in perfect shape uh, otherwise, aside from that cosmetic deal at this point. I went ahead and put in a new flat gasket. Uh, again, I don't know if it needed it. But um, it does, you know, that bezel seats down tight. This thing is super sealed up. So I went ahead and went with it. Even though the casing guide doesn't reference it, it definitely was working. So we're going to do that. We put the bezel back on here, and I'm just kind of getting it started, putting a little bit of pressure on it, but definitely not enough to seat it fully. But we'll put it on here uh, on one tool. I probably will eventually upgrade, but this cheap tool here is still suiting my needs. So I... You know, I can't really justify replacing it yet, although a rover press would be nice. But um, as much as that hand setting tool costs, that rover press and the die set for it's double. But um, boom, you can see that thing seat down there, and there's a really loud click when that thing set into place. And it, uh, it, uh, it, it, you definitely know it, it seated like it should. So we're going to go ahead and I uh, used uh, the air puffer and blew off the dial and the inside of the, the the crystal and just made sure that I got everything out of there that I could. I didn't really see anything, you know, any dust particles or anything. So I just it was super thorough because the last thing you want is to assemble this thing. And then later on, look at it on your wrist and like, oh, there's one tiny little piece of something on the underside of that crystal. It's going to drive you crazy. Here, uh, put a new O-ring on that crown and uh, putting that crown in for the final time. And then uh, once we have that in, we can put in the movement ring. You can see that cutout on that movement ring where it seats over that crown. That thing sits in there, and we have to have that in place before we can put the case clamps back in. But uh, those go in. Those go in with a lot less trouble than they come out with. Um, so it, it wasn't too bad. I mean, sometimes you got to move them around a little bit, but these were pretty darn easy. Even the screws getting the screws in were, was not difficult to get them started. But I am using my tweezers here. Um, just as, as an extra steady hand to, um, to get those in, but I'm getting them in there, you know, screwed down, but not tightened fully. That way there's a little bit of play in there. And, uh, cause I don't want to seat one side down too far and get this thing in crooked or anything, but get that second clamp in and get that screw in. And once I kind of have that thing snug down, then I go through and just put, you know, tighten them down fully. And now that movement is here we go. Yep. That movement is locked in place and is not going to go anywhere. So the next thing is the, um, automatic, the, the oscillating weight. And, uh, I don't know why I did it this way. I mean, I could put it on there and then do that, but I thought this way also gave you a really good view of that, that gear on the underside of it that engages with that one that almost, you know, it's at the six o'clock position on the, on the movement, but it, uh, I just thought it was a good view of it, but um, I just put a little bit of lubrication on three of those six ball bearings and I set this in place and I rotate it around a little bit just to make sure that that gear is meshing in with the teeth. I don't want it to drop down on top of it. So I just rotate it around briefly just to make sure that everything's, in a, you know, engaging like it should. And that looked great. And then I just move it around a little bit just to make sure that everything's cycling the way it should. I'm watching the automatic works and I'm watching the crown wheel and I'm watching the barrel and um, everything's rotating around like it should. So we're in the home stretch. So next is the case back gasket. So this is a new case back gasket and I'm going to just apply some silicone grease to this thing. And um, this applicator pad, I mean, at this point that the grease and the applicator pad is not the original grease. I've used it so much, but it's just standard silicone grease. I uh, bought one deal, little deal of it for, two or three dollars and it'll probably last me 20 years but um we'll get this set in place here and just to make sure that 
everything was good to go. And it actually took me a bit to make sure I had the right width on that flat gasket. I had the right diameter, but sometimes the width was too narrow, too wide. But this particular movement has got a channel that that thing sits in, and it needs to be an exact fit. But I, I found one in my assortment. And then uh, I'm just pressing on the rear. The rear case back is a snap case back. So um, I heard a little click when it went in, but I'm just rotating it around. I'm using, notice I'm using the plastic dies on that and just kind of working it down just to make sure that everything is uh, is working like it should. So, uh, and everything was sealed up and that, that case back was flush. So again, I'm just going through here and I'm just checking the, you know, everything just to make sure again, now that this thing is cased up, that uh, everything's working like it should. So I, um, that original strap, while I loved that original strap that was on it, uh, my wrists are uh, a little over eight inches, about 22 and a half centimeters. And I generally have to use XL size straps. And that original strap, although it fit that rally dial beautifully, I didn't have a, a chance at wearing it. <laughs> there's, there's no way. It was too small. So, you know, normal people, probably it fits them great. And uh, I kept the strap because I'll probably give it to some watch friends of mine or something. But um I ended up putting this leather one on there. I think it looks great, but um, I'm just doing a little fast forward action here. I don't know why. I just, I thought this was a great shot and uh, you know, I only let it run for a couple minutes, but this watch was just captivating. I don't know. I mean, and I know my desk lighting is not the greatest. That's something I'm actually going to work on. I'm going to have a solution to real soon is the, an updated lighting, but what would a video be on this channel without a trip into outer space? So I went to Saturn there, as you can see, and, there's Jupiter and Mars in the background, and that was a that was a fun trip. So uh, this watch is definitely deserving of an outer space trip. But there we have it. Uh, thank you, everybody. It means a lot. Our little channel is slowly growing, and um, I get a couple you know notifications each day, a couple new subscribers, and I can't thank you all enough. I sure hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, I'm working on the next one. We'll see you real soon. Take care.